Good morning. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but that song makes me want to dance, but don't worry, I'm not going to do it for you, so you're, you're good. Um, we'll see, maybe in a future week. Um, like Andrew said, I do hope that you all enjoyed and appreciated that extra hour of sleep. As the father of a six-month infant, I can say, thank you, Jesus. I greatly appreciated um, that extra hour. Before I officially, officially jump into and start into my message this morning, I want to do something just a little bit unique or special And um, I recognize that my wife and I, you know, we still feel new here at Broadfording Church. We really only came on staff about two months ago. And I know for many of you, um, maybe we're just getting the chance to know each other. And so I wanted to help you get to know me and my family just a little bit better. And there is no better way to do that. I want to show you some pictures of my family. So the tech team is going to bring up the first picture here of my family, my beautiful family. We're, uh, We're at the beach this year. So this is my extended family up here on The screen right in the middle, seated in the front, is my two uh, parents. They're incredibly godly parents that God has really blessed me with. Not in this picture. Um, I also have three incredibly godly grandparents uh, that have just been awesome examples in my life um, that are still a part of our life today. Um, So then, breaking down this picture here, I have an older brother um, who is on the right. i got to make sure. Yeah, he's on the right. Um, And he is holding his son. His wife is uh, seated in front of him, and they're holding, uh, she's holding their daughter. Uh, And then also, right behind my parents, and right next to me, is my older sister. She is holding her son. And we're also really praising God because on Halloween night, just a week ago, she gave birth to uh, her daughter. Um, So bringing the grand total of grandchildren up to five. And then right behind my parents is my younger sister uh, kind of rounding out the family. And then my, my wife, Ashley, is seated in front of me. So um, that is my extended family. And now I want to show you guys, this is my immediate family. I know many of you have seen Ashley um, here at Broadfording Church. She's the family life director here at Broadfording. Um, in my arms, I'm holding baby Olive. She was fresh out of the womb. She was maybe about two weeks old at that point. Um, <laughs> So Ashley and I, we're really excited. We're about to celebrate our three-year wedding anniversary this Wednesday, uh, which is unbelievable. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate that. Very, very sweet of you. We can't believe that it's already been three years. Like, you know, it's cliche, but time absolutely flies. And our marriage has brought with it all sorts of different blessings, but perhaps uh, none sweeter than the blessing that is baby Olive. And so um, these pictures were just meant to melt your heart. These were just freebies to just see some adorable pictures of baby Olive. I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so in future messages, you'll probably hear me uh, reference Star Wars. I might even slip it in today. We'll see how things go. Um, But it was our joy to dress up baby Olive as a little baby Ewok at the community treat night. That was um, a lot of fun. So I wanted to show you these pictures for two reasons. The, uh, The first one was because, again, I wanted you to just get to know me a little bit better. And one of the best ways is to see the people that I love the most. Uh, But the second reason that I wanted to show you these pictures is because statistics uh, show, research has proven that you will show, you will pay more attention if I show you pictures of my family. So I hope you don't feel tricked. Sorry, I already showed you the pictures, so you you have to pay attention now. Um, Yeah, that's the kind of really important things that they teach you in seminary. But another one of the important things that they teach you in seminary is that if you're preaching, you should really be mindful to avoid political topics. You should avoid political topics because you run the risk of dividing your audience in half. And so, with that being said, let's talk about Facebook. And uh, <laughs> what I want to do is I'm going to have those that like Facebook raise their hand, and then those that, uh, that hate Facebook are going to raise their hand, and then we're going to have a fist fight in the parking lot after that. It's going to be... It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, No, I'm just kidding, but I really do actually want to talk about Facebook, and I want to take us back to the year 2018. So in 2018, Facebook had experienced basically more than a decade of constant growth. Year after year, this platform grew from being a very small company to being one of the world's biggest companies and one of the most popular social media platforms that exists. However, in 2017, 2018, Facebook began to see a pretty drastic downward decline. People were leaving Facebook in droves, and there was a lot less interaction and engagement on the platform. And so in an attempt to reverse this trend, what Facebook did is it made a change to the algorithm of its news feed. If you have no clue what an algorithm is, that's all right. Uh, So the news feed 
is the primary feature that people first experience when they log into Facebook. It's that vertical feed of posts from the people and pages that you follow. Prior to 2018, the way the news feed worked is anything that you followed had an equal likelihood of showing up on your news feed. Everything had an equal chance of showing up. It was really just based on when it was posted. But to reverse the trend that was going on, Facebook changed the algorithm so that there would be a ranking system. And the ranking system was set up so that there would be a greater likelihood of seeing posts that had a lot of interaction or had a lot of engagement. And we hear that and it sounds, okay, that sounds innocent enough. Facebook said, our goal is simply just to show you more of the content that you want to see. And to their credit, it did exactly what they hoped that it would um, accomplish. It did reverse this downward trend and Facebook began to once again see an increase of users and engagement. However, unfortunately, and to Facebook's surprise, the platform also began to see a rapid rise in content that was hate-filled, racially motivated, politically divisive, and violence-inducing. So the question is, why is it that this happened? Unfortunately, it turned out that this was the kind of content that people actually wanted to see the most. This was the kind of content that people tended to engage with and interact with the most. The data demonstrated that we crave controversy, we are drawn to division, and we would all rather argue than agree. This algorithm change, it did nothing but expose some of the most fatal flaws uh, to our human nature. And we're left to wonder at the end of the day, how is it that this social media platform that was meant to bring us together turned into an arena where we all just tear each other apart. So this morning, as you saw in that video, we're starting a brand new series. The series is called You uh, and Me, and and like Andrew said, we're gonna be talking about relationships throughout this message, uh, throughout this series. So you plus me, you plus me, that's the equation that's at the core of every single relationship that we ever experience in our life. We all know that when it's, just, uh, when it's just me, things are very easy. Things are very simple, that I can do what I want, whenever I want. I get the picture of the Grinch who stole Christmas. I'm getting very excited uh, for Christmas, by the way. But the Grinch, what he did is he hid himself up at the top of Mount Crumpet. He was able to do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and he was rarely bothered by anyone. It's very simple when it's just me, but then when you is added to that equation, that's when life begins to become very complicated. We all know, if we can be honest for a moment, that relationships are hard, relationships are difficult, and that relationships can be very, very painful. We open ourselves up to the possibility of tremendous pain. And because they're both hard and painful, we can be tempted to follow the example of the Grinch and to just hide ourselves away, to isolate ourselves from others, and to insulate ourselves from any potential pain. But throughout this series, we want to talk about why it is that relationships can be and why they are so difficult. And we want to hear what the Bible has to say about relationships, how we were meant to enjoy them and experience them so that we don't just survive in relationships, but so that we can actually thrive in relationships. So in the upcoming weeks, we're going to look at um, a number of the different relational contexts that we all experience in our life, whether it be friendships, family, parenting, marriage, or the the broader community that's around us. We're going to look at uh, all these different relationships. But my goal for this week is to simply lay the foundation by going to the source and examining the very first human relationship that ever existed. My goal is for us to walk away today with a better grasp on why it is that the relationships that we're a part of can be so difficult. And then, in the following weeks, Pastor Bill is actually going to provide some solutions and strategies that we can use to overcome relational obstacles. What that means is that I've got the super easy job, and Pastor Bill has the nearly impossible job, so I wish him the best of luck in the weeks to come. So like I said, we're going to look at the very beginning. Today we're going to be focusing on Genesis 2 and 3. If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, In verse 18 is where we're going to start off. So I'm going to bring us up to speed this morning. This is what we've seen in Genesis 1 that's taken place. So out of total nothingness, God has spoken and he's brought into being every single thing that we see in the universe around us. After every single day of creation, God examines what it is that he created, and he says that it is good. And then after, um, on the sixth day of creation, God creates 
the very first human, a man named Adam, in his image, in his likeness. And then after all six of uh, days of creation are over, God examines everything that he's created, and he says that it was very good. On the seventh day, God rests, and he establishes the pattern of Sabbath rest that we continue to practice um, today. So then, in the first part of Genesis 2, God creates this beautiful garden in the east that's called Eden. He takes Adam and he places him in this garden, and he gives them the responsibility to take care of this garden. God gives Adam one and only one prohibition. And that prohibition is that he was not to eat from one tree in the garden, referred to as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God even explains it. God tells Adam why. He tells him that on the day that you eat from this tree, you will certainly die. And so this is where we're going to pick up the story this morning. So again, uh, we're going to jump in at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and we're going to read a nice section here. So read with me. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of me. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So throughout my message this morning, if you're a note taker, I have five points for you this morning. Even if you're not a note taker, I have five points for you this morning. And the purpose of these um, main points is to help us all kind of have handles on where we're going throughout this message and to be able to remember a little bit of what we heard at the end of the message. So the very first point that I have for you today is a very simple but powerful point, which is that we were created for community. We see this very clearly in that text that we just read. We were created for community. After nothing but good reports after every single day of creation, this is the very first time that God looks at the situation and says that something is not good. Adam is living in paradise. Every single one of his physical needs is met. He's living in total harmony with God uh, and all of creation. He's riding around on zebras and playing with monkeys. I filled in that last part because that's what I think I would probably be doing. And yet, even with all of this, God says that he's alone and that it's not good. God shows Adam every single animal that he created, but still no suitable helper was found for him. What Adam needed was an equal counterpart who was like him in every way. Someone with whom he could share mutual love and support. And so what happens is God initiates the world's very first surgery. He puts Adam under with anesthesia, and he makes a female companion for Adam. It's a beautiful thing that God gives Adam the privilege of naming Eve. When Ashley was pregnant and in the months uh, leading up to her giving birth, we would have conversations with people and we'd tell them we were having a girl. They would say, hey, I think this is an awesome name for a girl. Oh, what about this name? You should name her this. And uh, I would reply to that and say, hey, you know what you should do? You should have a daughter and then you can name her that. (laughs) The reason that we had the privilege of naming our daughter is because we had the responsibility of taking care of her. And in this moment, God gives Adam the the privilege of naming Eve because he was given the task of leading her, protecting her, and caring for her. That was his responsibility that he had. So the question is, why does Adam name her woman? Well, verse 25 says that they were both naked. And so my hypothesis from a very theological perspective is this, is that uh, on the very, upon seeing his wife for the very first time in all of her glory, Adam could not help but shout, whoa, man. And then he said, all right, we'll just roll with that. We'll see if that sticks. All jokes aside, this gives us a beautiful first glimpse into God's design for marriage. And I want us to take note that while they were both naked, they felt no shame. We're going to come back to that later. In this brief moment in time, there's nothing but relational harmony between husband and wife and between God and humanity. So in your, in your mind right now, enter the jaws theme song. Let's read now Genesis 3 verses 1 through 6. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The second point that I have for us uh, this morning is that Satan tempts us to sin. First, we were created for community, but secondly, Satan tempts us to sin. I have to give a very quick pause here and explain something. If you you know, we're following along when we read that passage, you'll notice that the word Satan or the name Satan is never mentioned, but really the, the evil villain that we see here is labeled the serpent. Now that we are at this time in history, we have the full breadth of scripture. We have both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so the New Testament authors were able to make it very clear that, that this serpent that's referred to here was an embodiment or was a representation of Satan. This angel created by God designed to worship God, but yet he desired that worship for himself. And so he led a rebellion um, from heaven. He fell from grace. And now he continues uh, with his goal of stealing as much glory from God as he possibly can. He continues to work in the earth for that same purpose today. So throughout the rest of my message, you'll hear me uh, say Satan or the serpent interchangeably now that we got that covered. All right. So tragically, what we see right here is a masterclass of deception by Satan. And I believe that it's actually worth us taking the time to break down the tactics that Satan uses here so that we can understand them and so that we can be prepared to defend against these same tactics when Satan brings them against us. I've got five tactics of Satan Satan that he uses. The first one I want you to see is notice how Satan starts off with a question. He starts off with a question. Often Satan's first goal for us is not outright rejecting of God, but subtle questioning of God. And so Satan starts off by just sowing these unseen seeds of doubt. Secondly, what Satan does is he focuses more on what God forbids than what God freely offers. God said, you can eat from any tree in the garden, but Satan flipped it around and the question was worded, did God say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Satan wants us to fixate on the few things that God tells us to avoid rather than seeing the many, many things that God's made available for us to enjoy. Uh, The third strategy of Satan is notice how he causes Eve to twist what it is that God really said. God told her not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but when Eve uh, retells what God said, she says it was just the tree that was in the middle of the garden. And when she rephrases it that way, it feels a lot more arbitrary and subjective as if God just made up this rule for no apparent reason. Secondly, God told um, Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree, but then Eve adds in there that God told her not to even touch the tree. She added something that God never actually said. And I believe that we often do the same thing. We poorly paraphrase what God really said, and we add restrictions that God never actually gave us. Fourth, Becoming more bold, Satan directly contradicts God's claim. Although God said, you will certainly die, here Satan says, you will not certainly die. Satan, the father of lies, accuses our Heavenly Father here of lying. Fifth and finally, Satan slanders God's motives. He claims that God doesn't want what's best for you, and he wants to keep you from what is best for you. I believe that those are two of the darkest lies that that exist in this entire world. That when we believe that God is not a loving provider who has our best interest in mind, we begin to believe that the best course of action that we can take is to take the situation into our own hands, and that's when all sorts of problems arise. In this moment, both Eve and Adam, Adam is not off the hook here, they both sinned tremendously. Eve failed by stepping out of her designed role. She failed to follow Adam, and she disobeyed God. The passage said she saw that it was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for wisdom. And what this is called right here is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. She saw, she desired, she took, and she ate. But Adam absolutely also failed by not living up to his designed role. Adam, who it says was quote-unquote with her, 
He stood idly by as this snake misused and manipulated his wife. He didn't step up to the plate and defend and protect his wife in the way that he was meant to. He failed to lead, and he followed Eve into sin. Let's keep reading here um, at verse 7. So then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The third point that I have for us this morning is that sin brings brokenness into community. Sin brings brokenness into community. Even before they have this conversation with God, Adam and Eve immediately feel the consequences of their sin, even without God telling them anything. All of a sudden, they're like, whoa, we're naked. And it really doesn't make sense as if they've never noticed before that they didn't have clothes on. So why was this? Why did, why did this happen? The issue that's at play here was much deeper than only what was on the surface. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they were unashamed of their outward nakedness because they had inward purity. They had nothing to hide on the inside, and therefore they felt no need to hide what was on the outside. But from this point on, Adam and Eve could never return to this original state of innocence that they once enjoyed right here in this moment. So what I want us to see, what I want us to notice is a really important sequence. It's a really important pattern of reaction to sin that's displayed by Adam and Eve. But I also believe that if we pay attention to this, we'll see this pattern playing out in our life, playing out in the relationships that we're a part of and playing out in the lives of others around us. A really important pattern of reaction. Um, all right, fine, I'll get my Star Wars quote out of the way. There's a really um, good quote in Star Wars. Master Yoda says, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. And he says that that's the reason that Anakin uh, should not be trained. And some of you are like, what is this guy talking about? But, but anyways, I want to steal from the template of Master Yoda there, uh, but I want to make this a biblically true, a biblically sound um, sequence. And so this is the quote. Sin leads to guilt, guilt leads to shame, shame leads to fear, Fear leads to hiding, and hiding leads to blaming. Sin, guilt, shame, fear, hiding, blaming. That's the order, that's the sequence, that's the way it plays out here, and I believe it's the way that it plays out in our lives as well. They're going to leave that up on the screen for a little while as we look at how this played out in their life. So after sinning, Adam and Eve feel the guilt and the shame of their sin. And because of that, they then fear that God would reject them. So Adam and Eve's first response to this fear that they feel is that they hide. They hide their nakedness with fig leaves, and then they hide themselves behind the trees that are there in the garden. And I believe that we tend to do the very same thing. We put on fake smiles and filters. We go through religious motions on the outside to compensate for the uh, guilt of our sin that we feel on the inside. We isolate ourselves from others and we avoid the tough but necessary conversations that our relationships need to heal and to grow. When people ask us how we're doing, we say we're doing great. We're saying God is good all the time and all the time God is good. But on the inside, we're actually really struggling. We're battling depression. We're battling anxiety, but we're unwilling to share it with others because we want to hide. When hiding didn't work, their second response was blaming. God asks Adam and Eve a number of different questions. But he didn't ask them these questions because he needed any information. God knew exactly what happened. He knew what was going on within their heart. But rather, the reason that God asked them these questions was to create the opportunity for them to acknowledge their fault and to seek forgiveness. But instead, instead of getting any confession, Adam and Eve respond with nothing but accusation. So God calls Adam to answer first because he was the one given the primary responsibility of leadership. And how does Adam respond? He starts by blaming God for giving him Eve. This is not a good start and a very bold move to do that to the God of the universe that created him and everything around him. 
We should never curse the blessings that God gives us. We should never curse the blessings that God gives us. Story time. Let me tell a very quick story. The year was 1999, and the Nintendo 64 came out. So uh, I don't know if anybody remembers the Nintendo 64. Lots of good memories. As you saw in the picture, I have three different siblings, so that's four total uh, children in my family, and the Nintendo 64 was conveniently de uh, designed for four players to play at the same time. So my family, one year, we got a Nintendo 64, and my head exploded because now I could play Mario Kart against all my different siblings. So one of our favorite pastimes was go down the basement and play Mario Kart 64 against each other. It was a blast. Now, the one problem with this was that we had the standard issue, all gray, boring controllers that came with a Nintendo 64. And so one year for Christmas, I um, had my number one gift that I wanted to ask for. And so I asked my parents for my very own special, uniquely colored controller. I wanted to have this special controller so that my other siblings would never argue about which controller was theirs, and they would know which controller was mine. And so... Um, my parents did what Arnold Schwarzenegger did in Jingle All the Way. They went out, they fought the crowds, and they bought this beautiful, translucent blue Nintendo 64 controller. And then they, they packaged it with um, the utmost precision. They tucked it away under the tree. They waited with bated breath on Christmas morning as their, uh, you know, their lovely third-born child uh, opened up his present. So when I opened up my present, my response was, oh, i got to make sure I get this right, I wanted red, not this stupid blue one. That was, that was my response. Okay, I had to make sure I get that right. And so my parents, in ridiculous grace, I don't understand how they didn't kick me out of the family. My mom, literally, she returned it to the store, and she got me the, the red one that I wanted, which is just, um, I don't know if I would have responded that way. I'll just say that. So why did I tell that story? Well, when I criticized the gift, I wasn't only criticizing the gift, but I was criticizing the giver of the gift. Uh, when we criticize the gifts that God gives us, it's not only a commentary on the gift, but it's a criticism of God, the giver of the gifts. Our God is a good father who gives good gifts to his children. So spouses and parents especially, speaking to myself here, there will be moments in life when our spouse or our children frustrate us, where they bother us, where they do something where we wish that they had not done it. But we must never be tempted to allow that to lead us to cursing the blessing and the gift that God has given us. Your spouse and your children are blessings from the Lord. Never curse the gifts that God gives you. Okay, uh, moving along. After blaming God for giving him Eve, Adam then blames Eve for giving him the fruit. In the end, Adam takes no responsibility whatsoever. Eve is up next. How does she respond? Here, Eve does follow Adam's example, and she continues the blame game. She blames the serpent for deceiving her. Neither person confessed their sin, and in so doing, they withheld from God the opportunity to offer them forgiveness. And all the while, Satan, the serpent, is watching and smiling. Let's keep reading. Um, we're going to pick up at verse 16. To the woman, um, this is God speaking. To the woman, God said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. The fourth point that I want us to see this morning is that brokenness causes consequences. Brokenness causes consequences. Both Adam and Eve, they received these um, tailored consequences that were connected directly to their specific acts of defiance. These consequences were not meant to crush Adam and Eve, but rather they were meant to continually remind them of the importance of submission to God. Both Adam and Eve and their future offspring would suffer with painful labor. To all my moms in the room, you know exactly what I'm talking about in the first sense. 
And to anyone in the room that maybe has a background with farming or agriculture, you know exactly what I'm talking about by painful labor in the other sense. But I want us to notice in verse 16 that a relational consequence is also introduced. God tells Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Essentially what God is saying is that whereas before you both enjoyed perfect harmony, joyful submission, and loving leadership, now there will be relational tension. Finally, I want us to notice that God provides a more permanent solution to their nakedness. It says that God provides for them leather or garments of skin. So a question we have to wonder is where did this skin, where did this leather come from? I would say almost definitely, most likely an animal had to be sacrificed. An animal had to be killed in order to provide this leather or this, this garment of skin. So what we see here is the very first instance of sacrifice as a result of sin, of the death of a life as the consequence for sin. And this shows us sin's heavy cost. But thankfully, though, in God's grace, a promise was given in the midst of these consequences. This is the last scripture we're going to look at this morning. We'll pick up at verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Fifth and final point for us this morning is that Jesus reverses curses and restores community. Jesus reverses curses and restores community. When God is laying down these consequences for sin, the very first person that he addresses is actually the serpent. Verse 15 contains what is referred to as the proto-evangelium. Proto-evangelium. Proto means first. Evangelium is tied to the word evangelia, which means good news. And it's from that that we get gospel. So this is the first gospel, the first proclamation of the gospel. Um, Proto-evangelium, feel free to steal that and use it in your small group. I guarantee you, you'll impress everyone there. But this is, this is amazing because in only the third chapter of the Bible... God provides this promise of hope that a descendant of Eve will one day come to crush the serpent. And as is always true, God did in fact fulfill this promise. Several millennia later, God sent his son Jesus to be born of a woman to come to this earth. A young woman named uh, Mary, she experienced painful labor just like Eve, and she gave birth to her son Jesus who would one day become the world's savior. Unlike Adam and Eve and every one of their descendants since that time, Jesus lived a life that was completely separate from sin, completely sin-free. His perfection gave him right standing before God, and it gave him the opportunity to be a worthy sacrifice on our behalf, on the behalf of our sin. Jesus knew that his mission on earth was to die, and so he willingly surrendered himself to an excruciating death on a Roman cross. After tremendous suffering on that cross, he died. And in that way, he experienced the striking of his heel by the serpent. However, this, this heel striking was non-lethal, and it was only temporary. Because three days later, three days after being spent in a tomb, Jesus rose from the dead, demonstrating God's power over the grave and signifying that the serpent's days were absolutely numbered. Because of his sacrifice and resurrection, the offer on the table this morning is that anyone who believes in Jesus, who calls on him as their Lord and Savior, will be forgiven of their sins, will be made new, and will be given the promise of eternal life with God. That's the offer that's on the table this morning. And beyond this, there is coming a day when the serpent will be fully, finally defeated, and where everything that was lost in the garden will be fully restored. To recap what we heard this morning, we were created for community. Satan tempts us to sin. Sin brings brokenness into community. Brokenness causes consequences. Jesus reverses curses and restores community. So the question for us this morning is like, what does this look like here at Broad Fording Church? Satan is still alive today. Satan is still at work, and he has the same mission that he had before, which is to push us away from community and keep us in isolation from God and each other. 
And so the opportunity for us in the weeks upcoming is we're going to hear several strategies that we can do to push away that tendency and to push towards community. And I'm going to leave a lot of that for Pastor Bill, but I want to take just a second and talk to you about what I believe is one of the most uh, effective and powerful ways that we can push into and create community here at Broad Fording Church. What I want to talk about for two minutes is, is small groups. I want to talk about small groups. So my role here at Broad Fording Church, I am the discipleship pastor. And I have a couple of different hats attached to that. One of those is that I'm the youth pastor. But another big part of that is that I'm the small groups director. I love small groups. My life has been changed in small groups. I've seen the power of the church be unleashed and unlocked within small groups. If you're wondering what I mean by small groups, small groups is relational communities of about 6 to 12 believers who commit to growing in their relationships with God and growing in their relationships with each other. It's context where we can share our needs, share our struggles, share our prayers, share food with each other. It's opportunities where we can not just be preached to, but where we can have dialogue about what the Bible says, where we can ask questions and actually have them answered. And so is, uh, since coming on staff, one of the biggest things that I've been doing alongside Pastor Bill is I've been praying, God, what is the vision that you have for small groups here at Broad Fording Church? He and I, we've been talking, we've been strategizing, we've been developing the mission, vision, and values as we move into 2022 for small groups. So this morning, I want to just whet your appetite a little bit with one part of that vision that you're going to hear us talk more about as we move forward. So when it comes to groups, one part of the vision that I want you to hear is that we want to see a day where every person that calls Broad Fording Church home is a part of a small group. And you might hear that, that might feel like a stretch, but we believe it's possible. We believe it's going to be best for you, and we believe it's going to be the best thing for Broad Fording Church. It's the way that we remain healthy. So to break this down, if we're going to have every person in a group, that means that we need to have a group for every person. And if we're going to have a group for every person, that means that we need to have a leader for every group. And so the invitation that I want to just briefly put out today, and again, you're going to hear us talk more about this in the months to come, um, I'm going to put my email address up on the screen right now. And if you believe that God may put it on your heart to consider being a small group leader, I would love in the weeks to come, you can catch me today to have a conversation with you about how we can help you get set up to be a small group leader. We have training that we can take you through to prepare you for what this looks like. You do not have to have a Bible degree. You do not have to have the Bible memorized. You do not have to teach in a class format for 30 minutes or 60 minutes. But really, we're looking for individuals that will be willing to open up their home, open up a space where there can be the context to go deep in our relationship with each other and with God. If that's you, I would love it if you reached out to me. This morning, in closing, I want us to go back to that pattern of reaction to sin that we saw earlier today. They're going to bring it up on the screen. We saw earlier that sin leads to guilt, that guilt leads to shame, that shame leads to fear, fear leads to hiding, and hiding leads to blaming. But that one point that I had was that Jesus reverses curses, that the curse that was brought about by sin, Jesus alone has the power to put this sequence in the opposite order. The way that he did this is that on the cross, Jesus reversed the curse. Jesus took the blame that was due to us, he calls us out of hiding. He tells us that we don't have to fear, but that we can be a part of his family. He wore our shame as he hung on the cross, and he carried our guilt, and he paid the cost for our sin. And because of that, Jesus is able to completely wipe away and reverse this pattern that breaks so many of the relationships that we're a part of. This morning, if you've never come into a relationship with Jesus, that is absolutely the best and first place that you need to start is to come to him. His arms are wide open. Forgiveness is on the table. He's waiting for you to acknowledge your need for him so that he can offer that forgiveness to you. And for the rest of us, as we prepare to sing here in a moment, the question I want to ask you is where in your life are you seeing brokenness in the relationships that you're a part of? Where has your sin or the sin of other people brought brokenness to where there should be wholeness in your relationships?